Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 396, featuring part two of my interview with the one and only Leonard Boyarski. In this segment, we focus in on Fallout, I talk about how that uh, game evolved from a, a Mad Max style uh, setting uh, into that wonderful 50s retro uh, futurism uh, that the game is so uh, celebrated for today. Uh, we talk about Leonard's contributions to that, and I think you'll really be surprised to hear some of these behind the scenes uh, stories about uh, what was going on. Uh, we also get in uh, towards the end into uh, why they decided to uh, leave Interplay after uh, really becoming a victim of their own success and founding Troika. Anyway, a lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Leonard Boyarski. Well, it must have been this moment of fate when Tim Kaine uh, posted that it was an announcement advertisement. He wanted to get some guys together to talk about some game ideas to go with his GURPS uh, engine he was working on. I mean, talk about it. that. Really sounds like a case of being at the right place at the right time. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure. Um, I was talking to Tim about this the other day, and neither of us can remember because it seemed to me. It seems to me like I had already been assigned to whatever Tim's project was going to be. I was on Stonekeep. And it's almost like I was the last man standing. The art director had quit and he had said, you know, Leonard, you should be the art director on the next Stone Keep, but Stone Keep 2 never really took off. So it was kind of like I was going to be the lead artist on something. And I think Tim's was like the next in the queue. And I'd already been playing GURPS with Tim and a couple of the other guys who were part of the base uh, Fallout team. So it wasn't so much that I saw that and said, oh, I'm going to go do this. It was kind of like I was already like, well, that's my project. Now, I don't remember if that's true or not. I don't remember at what point, and Tim can't either, like I was actually assigned to the team. Uh, Jason was assigned, and so I must have been because I was already hanging out with Jason, and and um, me and him would go to the meetings together. So by process of elimination, it seems to me that I was already assigned to the project. But I think I would have gone anyway because Tim is a really just just very um, – he was a great, great DM, a great dungeon master – um, people knew that he was a fun guy to work with. So the fact that he was starting a project, I feel like everybody would have been like, Oh, let's get in on this project. It'd be fun to work yeah. with Tim. And like, like we both said, you know, I think it was six people showed up and that was including with, me, with, with Jason free and Tim. pizza <laughs> and the free pizza. I mean, even if it was just for the free pizza, you'd think more Jeez, than six people would have shown up. up with that. I don't know. Well, I do have a question from, uh, uh David Bella sent this, so this one in. He says, uh, or he's, he's asks, uh, what were the inspirations behind the very unique 1950s sci-fi theme for Fallout? And then I recall you saying in that uh, that talk that it was really not supposed to be like this. Or original vision was just something more Road Warrior, uh, Road Warrior-ish, right? And then, yeah, it's it's really funny because you know all the stuff I was saying earlier in the interview about how Art Center prepares you to make IPs and do all this stuff. I didn't even think about that. We started the game. We're like, oh, we want to make a Road Warrior-esque Mad Max kind of uh, a video game. So we just started making that game. I didn't put a lot of thought into it, um, opposed to, uh, you know, in addition to, you know, just going, oh, the, we're, this is what we're going to make. And it wasn't until, I don't know, six, eight months in, you, you, it couldn't have been a year, um, that just this occurred to me. I'm like, and I don't know why I've tried to track back and find reasons for why this this thing came to me while I was driving home one night. Um, I just thought that would be really cool if it was this like 1950s thing. I think it was a combination of, of things I've been able to kind of figure out. I'd recently been reading Hard Boiled by Frank Miller and Jeff Darrow. And if you look at that, you can see a lot of this, the uh, the basic raw material for, for the world, I think. Um, in terms of the, the artistic style of that. Um, and then the other thing was, um, in retrospect, looking at it, a lot of what we were doing felt very 50s B-movie. Um, the plots, the story we were telling, uh, the fact that we came up with super mutants. Um, it was all very comic booky. They're all very B-movie. Uh, we wanted it to feel like a, without ever having said this, it seems in hindsight, we were all like into this kind of like, you know, it's very pulpy. It's very B science fiction. -y. 
So, and I said this at the talk too, when I came in and said, this is what we're going to do, we really didn't change anything that we'd already done. We just, from that moment forward, started building all this 50s stuff into it. So there's kind of this mix of, of post-apocalyptic road warrior, um, some even the original alien influence. And then all of a sudden you get all this 1950s stuff and that kind of like all combined to make this. Um, and a lot of the things we figured out about it, like the fact that they never went beyond transistors, they stayed with the vacuum tubes, started with me going, we need a lot of vacuum tubes. Everything would look cooler if it had vacuum tubes on it. And Tim's like, well, you know, if they never did, if they never went over to transistors, this would make it so that you wouldn't be as susceptible to an EMP blast. I'm like, oh, that's great. So it was really this 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 organic um, growing of the IP or growing of this kind of idea for what we wanted to do. Um, but if you asked me at the time, I probably had no idea or I couldn't have told you why I thought it was such a great idea. Now, luckily, um, we were at that point where it's just like they were happy with the game we were making. They tried to, I think, they might have even tried to cancel it once before then because this was before the whole GURPS thing went down. Maybe, I don't know, you'd, we'd have to check with Tim on the timeline on that. But they were happy enough with it, they'd, they'd let us keep going, but they really didn't care about it. So I went and I told Rob Nessler, the art director at the time of the, of the 3D division, uh, the 3D art division at Interplay, I said, this is what I want to do. And he's like, I don't really know what you're talking about, but that sounds great. You seem really passionate about it, go for it. So I owe him you know, the fact that we made that game. He was the first person who, who had enough faith in me to just say, yeah, run with it. And Tim was like, Tim's colorblind, which he, he's talked about frequently. And he, he's, he's one of these, uh, he's a very, um, he knows what he does well and he knows what he doesn't do well. Unlike some people who are given the, uh, you know, the reins to a project, they're like, this is my vision and everything's gonna be my way whether I know anything about it or not. Tim was very adamant. I know nothing about art. You guys know about art. Just do what you want and make it look cool. So he was like, yeah, that sounds great. Do it. Do what you guys want. Um, so it was just really this, this creative environment where people like really had faith in everybody who was doing what they were good at. Uh, the people who weren't good at that said, you know, you know what you're doing. Go for it. Yeah, that's really amazing. I was thinking uh, during the talk, too, you'd mentioned the, uh, the the fallout boy and the real happy uh, yeah. sort of look to him and the, soup, the sort of ultra violence that went with that. And it was and of course, playing that today, or playing it even back then, you, everything just feels natural. It's kind of hard to imagine it any other way. Uh, but like with that, you were saying it was there was some discussion about whether that was appropriate, and I guess the whole fallout with the Steve Jackson you know, over these elements. So it didn't have to be the way that it turned out, right? Uh, well, actually, Steve Jackson was the only one who had a problem with it or had any question about <laughs> he was it. Was the only one? <laughs> yeah, and That's which was really weird. Um, after we got over the like, yeah, we're doing this 1950s thing, um, it never even occurred to me that people wouldn't like the whole Pip, uh, Pip Boy. Jeez, I almost made the, the ca Cardinal Sin there calling him the Pip Boy. Um, <laughs> the Pip Boy was the guy who looked like the Bob's Big Boy guy. Um, no, the Vault Boy, which Vault we, Boy. we never had a name for the whole, the whole time we were making the game. Um, I never, ever even considered that people would have a problem with it because to me it was just a solution to a problem. And that problem was... How do we convey all of these different things that you can do in the gate of the game to the player without having, you know, 500 icons, which was how we started out. So it was never it was more of a solution to a problem than it was like this is this great artistic statement. And it just happened to be funny and, and add to the setting. So when Steve Jackson, I think we were all surprised because there was no one at the company had any kind of issue with it. Um, unlike some other things we did, like the ending and, and things like that were kind of like raised a couple of eyebrows. Um, so yeah, when Steve Jackson came back and said, yeah, I don't like, he didn't like the intro and he didn't like the, the vault boy, which were two things that most people at the company were saying they loved about the game. Um, so, you know, Brian Fargo, to Brian Fargo's credit, he's just like, um, well, then I guess we're not doing GURPS. And he went to Tim and, and asked him how, how difficult it would be to take GURPS out. And luckily because GURPS is modular, we could just take out all the GURPS stuff and put in our own skill module and combat module and we'd be, we're ready to go. Yeah, I think you made the right call on that. <laughs> uh, you know, speaking of uh, Fargo, or Brian uh, Fargo, he wanted you to just, I guess he wanted this to be a Wasteland game, right? But didn't, that didn't work out, so it actually turned out, to, again, to be a good thing that you got to do your own, own Yeah, um, it's funny that when we first started making it, we decided it, we wanted to be a, um, a, a post-apocalyptic game. 
uh, that was mostly me and Jason pushing like sometimes subtly, sometimes not so subtly, like we shouldn't do fantasy. We should do this post-apocalyptic thing. Um, but eventually everybody got on board with that. And it was only after we decided we were making this, this post-apocalyptic game that, that we started hearing um, that Brian thought it'd be a good idea to make Wasteland 2. And we all thought that was a really good idea too. Um, I really didn't know that much about Wasteland uh, at that point. And uh, I started playing it a little bit, but it was too fast. We didn't, the, the version I had didn't work on the computers. <laughs> I would say modern computers at the time. I had a Pentium. It was too fast to play, to play Wasteland. We, you know, there was no way to, to, to play it at that point. And it came out later on the 10th anniversary, I think, of Interplays. Uh, but by that time, we were deep into, into Fallout. So when he said that, I'm like, that's great. You know, we'll throw a, throw a Wasteland 2 title on there. It'll, it'll sell more copies. And I don't know why I never even thought like, well, I should probably like research Wasteland 2 and figure out what that game's all about um, because we're going to make it Wasteland 2. We just kept making the game we were making. We never, ever changed anything. Um, the only things we did is after we after we couldn't get Wasteland 2 and kept it being Fallout, um, we threw in some references like the uh, the guy who said he was a, a desert raider, not a desert raider, a desert ranger. Um, it's not Ian. I can't even remember his name. I remember what he looks like. Uh, but we put little nods to Wasteland in there after the fact. But yeah, we never, um, I don't know if we, in the back of our minds, we never thought we'd get it or we didn't care, but <laughs> we never changed direction or did anything in any way, shape or form to make it an appropriate Wasteland 2 title. Another of the things I wanted to ask about was this, I always describe Fallout as having isometric perspective, but you said in this talk, it's not really isometric. It's this other thing. Uh, Cavalier Oblique, <laughs> you know, this kind of just went right over my head. I just wondered if you could kind of explain what what is this? I can go get Tim if you want. I, <laughs> <laughs> I really can't. But it's not because isometric. That's... I have that part right. No, um, it has to do with whether the lines converge or not. I believe, I don't know, I don't even know. One of them, the lines actually converge and one of them, the lines never converge. They're completely parallel. I believe Cavalier Oblique is the one where the lines slightly converge. It looks like it's isometric. It looks like the lines are completely parallel, but they're not. There's a subtle um, perspective to them, which makes it look a little bit more realistic and less flat and blocky. Like if you look at, say, I believe, once again, I'm not an a, a expert on it. I believe like the Ultimas were pure isometric. And if you look at them compared to Fallout, they look a little bit more flat. If you look at Fallout, it's and part of it is that it's 3D, but I mean rendered 3D and then turned into sprites. Um, Fallout looks like it has a little bit more depth. I believe that's what it is, but I could be completely wrong. I just remember it's it's Cavalier Oblique because Tim always says that when everyone ever anybody refers to it as an isometric game. I like the term Cavalier Oblique. You know, that's a. It does sound. It sounds much more impressive yeah, than isometric. A, well, that's. You know that's Cavalier Oblique, not isometric. <laughs> exactly. Right? Yeah, I'm gonna have like to <laughs> Oh yes, of course. We would go at Cavalier Oblique instead of isometric. <laughs> that's great. Uh, so during a Fallout, it seems like that was when you really started to develop this concept of the branching narratives and, and letting the players play the game the way they wanted to, and, and, and yeah. to try to avoid sort of forcing, uh, you know, more of a linear uh, play through the plot. Your choices matter, you know, all this sort of thing. And uh, again, I kind of compared this to uh, this idea of the, you know, kind of being in the background, not trying to draw, like as a writer, you don't want to keep drawing attention. Look, look how talented of a writer I am. You know, that's not the goal. Yeah. It's more about making the player feel like they're the ones coming up with the story. I mean, that, that sounds really difficult to do. It's, it is challenging because what you have to do is you have to craft a story where uh, the dramatic moments in the story can unfold a couple of different ways. And one of the things that some RPG developers do is that they give you a lot of um, freedom and a lot of choices to make, but at specific points in the story, they're very tied to like, no, it's going to play out this way no matter what you did or no matter what you do. Um, and that's just not our philosophy. Uh, I don't remember exactly how that started. I know that it probably started with Tim if I, if I had to bet. Um, but our main thing going into Fallout um, from minute one was that whatever the player did mattered and the player could do anything that they wanted to do. Um, so that's and that's just something we've carried through. And, you know, uh, we didn't think 
a lot at the time about the philosophy behind that. That was just kind of like, this is what we're going to do. So we started developing games that way. And that just always seemed to be the way we felt comfortable making games. And perhaps it's because I didn't start out as a writer. I mean, I wrote stuff when I was a kid. I liked writing. I was always did way better in classes like English or creative writing than I did in math. But I was always, from the time I was five years old, I was focused on being an artist. Um, and it was only when, you know, as I talked about in in, uh, in Portugal, it was only when the designers kind of dropped the ball and me and Jason had to like be like, oh, all of a sudden we're writers. We have to start writing a whole bunch of stuff that we had to kind of adapt to that way of telling a story because that was already how we had planned out the whole game, which is kind of funny because – me and Tim and Jason, three people who are definitely not writers at the time, said, oh, this is how this game is going to be written. Uh, hey, writers, go off and write this. We're going to go do our stuff. Tim's going to program. We're going to do our art, you know, never knowing that how complex that makes the story. We're just like, yeah, go do this. <laughs> um, so then we had to deal with it when we had to come in and actually be writers on it. Um, but in a weird way, it's always felt very natural to me. When I design stuff, um, I always start with, oh, here's a cool idea. OK, how would the how would the player how would this work if the player decided he didn't want anything to do with what you're trying to get him to do? Um, that's like literally every time we come up with an idea for our game, whether it's today or whether it's when we were making Arcanum or Vampire, it's just like, OK, here's the great idea. OK, what's going to happen if the player doesn't want to go along with your great idea? Yeah, I think that's why it's so rare to find a, a novelist that can transition into making games uh, successfully, right? Because they, they want to have that control. You know, they, they know what they're trying to say. And uh, they probably feel like, hey, you're you're playing the, my game all wrong. You know, you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> yeah, because uh, they're trying to tell one story. And I understand that um, instinct. But I think, ironically, I'm not coming up as a writer and not actually thinking of myself as like, oh, I'm a writer. Um, in a way, you could look at it like uh, we're giving you a whole bunch of different stories. So it's not like there's not all this pressure on our one story to be fantastic. Because it's like it's like it's almost like a puzzle that you put together as a player because you did this over here differently than some other player did it. And then you made this choice over here. So it's almost like you're just making all these puzzle pieces that go together as the player plays the game, um, which could end up with some really weird um, emergent gameplay. Uh, but most time, more times than not, I think it actually adds to the um, player's enjoyment of the game because a lot of a lot of uh, most game developers will tell you that the best um, stories you get from people playing games are the stories when they tell you, um, this is how me and my friends played the game if it's multiplayer, or this is what I did in the game. Uh, speaking about RPGs, obviously there's a lot of games that are very linear and you just go down the path. But when it comes to RPGs, I think people have the most fun when they're talking about the story that they created about their character, how the game played out for them. And that's that to me is... Um, I think a lot of people pay lip service to trying to like uh, get the player to be able to have that experience. But I feel like um, that's just a key pillar for us every time we've sat down, me and Tim have sat down to make a game. Um, and ironically, I feel like I'm better at that than I probably would be at making a very linear story. Well, we were talking about this fateful decision to join uh, Tim and uh, Jason to work on uh, fallout so then you had another big decision with them right to leave interplay and get into this uh, troika venture i mean that was uh i mean was that a tough decision for you or did it just seem like a no-brainer yeah oh i i don't think it was very tough you know looking back on it i'm surprised that it wasn't more difficult because i already had a family um but at the time we had had such a good good experience making fallout and it was such a, a great thing that we were proud of at the time um that when we both told the stories about how um, all of a sudden it became popular and people liked it, people at the company started paying attention. And you're kind of a victim, so of your to, own, victim of your own success, right? When, a little bit. Yeah. And so, you know, we were old enough at the time that even while we were making it, I knew that it was never going to be that good again because I could just see around me what was going on in the rest of the company. And I was cognizant of the weird um, confluence of events that, that allowed us to make this game. And I'm just like, I was really happy and excited the whole time. Cause I'm like, I can't believe that this happened. So it wasn't an instance where we didn't understand what we had until it was over. We all kind of understood that we were very lucky and very fortunate to be in that position. And it's almost like it was almost immediate. As soon as we finished that those walls started falling down 
And instead of it becoming this experience that that really, you know, made us upset and turned us, a, you know, turned to fall out into a sour experience for us, we just decided we want to go off and do our own thing. Um, you know, and that's where the hubris of, of youth comes in. We're just like, well, we made fallout. We could do it again. People will give us money to do this. We had no idea what we were doing. Um, we got a contract in five months, uh, which looking back on it is like, that's a really quick turnaround, especially for a company that's never made anything before. Um, but at the time it was kind of like the, the, if we had gone much longer, we wouldn't have done it because Tim was saying, you know, I'm going to be out after this amount of time. And I was kind of in the same position because, like I said, I had a family to support. So if we hadn't have gotten a contract in five months, we would have been done. But, you know, now looking back on it, it'd be like, that's ridiculous to, to count on getting a contract in five months. and Or to think that you're going to be able to find somebody who's going to be like, yeah, you guys made Fallout. Make whatever you want to make, which was fantastic for Sierra to do at the time. It was just really, um, once again, it felt a lot like Fallout in that. Um, it was the perfect time to do something like that. It, I don't think we could have gotten away with that a couple years earlier or a couple years later. Um, but once again, we got fairly lucky and, and were able to do it. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with the third and sadly final installment, at least for now, uh, with the great Leonard. Uh, a lot of great stuff coming up, so please, uh, please stay tuned. I know you will enjoy it. As always, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, and you, uh, for supporting Matt Chet. Couldn't do it without you guys. Remember, that there's no uh, ads on these shows. There's no uh, external funding coming in from anywhere. It's just entirely uh, driven by people just like you who uh, chip in a buck a show, two bucks a show, uh, just whatever the show is worth to you, whatever you can uh, comfortably manage. Uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, now, if you want to support the show, uh, just go over that, that Patreon link in the show notes, uh, or you can look for the links to Good Old Games at uh, the matchat.us site. I'm an affiliate of theirs. Uh, or you could just go to PayPal on the MattChat site as well. Uh, however, I do have an update uh, about the, uh, the secret uh, MattChat loot uh, that will be coming up here very quickly. Uh, we're in the final stages of that. We've got the artwork. It's being uh, proofed and all that good stuff and about to put the, uh, the order in. Uh, so the deal with that uh, is going to be if you have a lifetime contribution of $100 or more, remember that's lifetime contribution, uh, you will get one of these special items. Uh, now to get it to you though, I need you to go to the uh, Patreon site, edit your uh, profile, and make sure that your uh, correct mailing address is in there. I'll let you know again as we get closer to the uh, production, but uh, if you got a second, just hop, hop over there to Patreon, make sure your mailing address is correct, because uh, you, <laughs> you definitely don't want to miss out on getting one of these items. So uh, anyway, I'll keep you posted as we learn more on that, but it's very, very exciting. I know you guys are going to love these things. And I'm going to keep, uh, keep you in suspense about what it actually is. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? All right, let's see. First thing up here is from good old Shane Stacks. He says, do not buy a graphics card today. Uh, apparently this uh, cryptocurrency mining thing has gotten to, uh, <laughs> it's kind of gotten so out of control uh, that people are just scooping up these uh, high powered graphics cards like the GTX 1080 Ti, and they're going for like twice, if not three times their uh, suggested retail price. So. Uh, anyway, you probably, if you've been shopping for a graphics card and you're like, what the heck is, <laughs> that's a lot more expensive than it was uh, last time. Uh, there you go. So you might want to wait a while to see how this crypto thing uh, shakes itself out. Uh, it's really crazy though. I mean, $1,300 for a GPU uh, that's normally, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, it actually is half, uh, that's twice what it usually sells for. So it's just crazy. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys are doing that crypto mining stuff, but uh, man, if you're making that kind of cash, you need to send some of it over. Uh, <laughs> send some of it to Matt Chat. Uh, uh, let's see what else we have here. Pillars of Eternity 2, Deadfire, launch date announced, pre-orders are open. Uh, so that launch date is April th uh, 3rd on that. 
And I was looking at these uh, the items you get for pre-ordering. You get some uh, it's, it's in-game stuff: a skull, a hawk, a black flag. <laughs> Not exactly sure how all this stuff, if it's just decorative or what, but it looks cool. And that's uh, basically 50 bucks for that. Uh, for 60, you get the soundtrack. Uh, but the one I'm really interested in is the uh, Obsidian Physical Edition. Uh, so this would come with, a, the, of course, the box, but also a cloth map, a notepad, and some postcards. It's supposed to be 80 bucks, but, you know, I was looking all over the site, and I couldn't figure out how to actually pre-order that one. I could pre-order the digital version, but, you know, I'm like, you know, I'll spend the extra 5 bucks to get all the, the physical stuff. So, uh, anyway, I, I don't know what's going on with that. Uh, if you know, please chime in. Because uh, I, I want to make sure I get the uh, the correct one pre-ordered. So I've, I've, I've contacted Obsidian. Uh, hopefully they'll get back to me soon on that. But, you know, come on. Cloth map, who's going to pass that up? Uh, and then good old Stig. He's got a couple of news items here. First up is Frostpunk, a city survival game set in a steampunk ice age. So in a frozen world, people develop steam-powered tech to oppose the cold. Sounds like Minnesota. Uh, and as a city ruler, you have to manage both the inhabitants and the infrastructure. You get tactical skills, uh, morality, <laughs> choices affecting the basic foundation of what we consider an organized society. And that's from 11-Bit Studios. Uh, I'm not sure where they're out of off the top of my head. But uh, anyway, I was looking at some of their other games, and, and they definitely have shown they can deliver. So I'm really excited about this uh, Frostpunk game. And uh, Stig also wrote in about the Witcher plot episode, Script is Complete. Uh, so apparently The Witcher will be coming to Netflix. <laughs> uh, at least it's a step closer to that. Uh, so I know a lot of you guys are huge Witcher fans. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of information here about it. Uh, apparently the uh, lady that's working on it, Lauren Schmidt Hishrick, and says she's done some other adaptations, uh, including Daredevil and The Defenders. So... Uh, I'm actually really, I, I really like the Daredevil show, so <laughs> maybe there's, uh, maybe this will turn out to be really, really awesome. So uh, anyway, I'll keep you uh, posted on that. And then uh, finally, this is kind of random, but I was uh, on, uh, I was checking out Twitter before I did this, and Wellmont Studios, that's Joe and Hannah, uh, posted this. <laughs> they say, good to see this Baldur's Gate portrait still having a good gig. Uh, this is Hidden Legends uh, Pure Honey Mead Honey Wine, so... Uh, some of the guys uh, uh, were looking at this really closely, and they think it's not actually the same. <laughs> Other people say it was kind of this uh, unused image from Baldur's Gate. So I, I don't know what's going on, but it definitely looks uh, like it's from Baldur's Gate to me. I have to see if I can find some of this. It's been a while since I've had mead anyway, so it'd be kind of, kind of cool if I could track this down. All right, so that'll do it for the news. What about that ale of the week? So I was looking for something really special to celebrate this uh, episode. I mean, how many people get to talk to Leonard Bjarsky about Fallout? <laughs> I consider myself really, really lucky uh, and fortunate to get to meet so many of my uh, childhood heroes uh, on Matchhead. You know, the job has its perks. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I wanted something really good, and I got this. It's a barrel-aged patience. Uh, this is out of uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Fulton Company. Uh, it's a really good uh, brewery there. Um, and it's, this is actually a numbered edition. This is 1550 of 1600. So it looks like I caught it just in time. Barrel-aged patience barley wine aged in cognac barrels. <laughs> uh, that just sounds great. Uh, let's see. I don't see any information. Oh, there's a little bit here. Uh, so it says 10% of profits invested in the full 10 fund. All right. Not sure what that means. Uh, they also have some information. Let's see. 88 IBUs. Uh, alcohol, 13.7%. Uh, so that's a little strong for a beer, but for barley wine, that's, that's about right. Uh, anyway, uh, let's get this open and see what it's all about. <sighs> all right, so just enjoying the aromas coming off of this uh, uh, barrel-aged patience. I don't know if you can tell. I do have a bit of a cold. I don't know. I just can't seem to shake this thing. Uh, so it's kind of affecting my, uh, <laughs> uh, my nose, basically, but... I can still smell that cognac barrels. You know, I, to be honest, I don't know if I'd be able to tell the difference between a cognac barrel-aged uh, uh, barley wine and a bourbon barrels or whatever. Maybe the cognac, you know, it smells very sweet to me. It's a bit, kind of a chocolatey, cherry-like aroma. 
I just, it smells really good. You don't get any alcohol fumes or anything unpleasant coming off of this. It's just a, a really nice uh, aroma. Again, very, uh, <laughs> really makes you want to try it. So uh, let's give it a taste. Wow, this is a super sweet. It goes down just like a, you know, big uh, handful of chocolate covered cherries. Uh, really light. Uh, uh, aftertaste on that, there's some kind of apricot peach flavors there. Yeah, really, I'm really tasting that real sort of a sweet, chocolatey, uh, maybe kind of a raisin, uh, grape-like flavor. It's actually really, really tasty. I'm going to try this again. Yeah, this is just, uh, you know, absolutely delicious stuff. Uh, you know, I don't even taste any alcohol in this at all. It's just a really sweet, cherry, chocolatey. You can sort of taste a little bit of that, uh, I guess, the cognac uh, barrel flavors on this. Kind of makes it a little bit smokier. Uh, I'm going to try it one more time. Yeah, that is just uh, an exceptional uh, brew here. Uh, normally with these, sometimes you get these things and they... Uh, the alcohol just kind of knocks you out. It's just, just too pungent, <laughs> too powerful. Uh, this one, though, is just completely smooth, very, very sweet. Uh, the, the flavors are great, a lot of variety on that. Uh, no unpleasant aftertaste. Uh, it's just, you know, <laughs> just straight up delicious. You know, what can I say? I'm going to go definitely gonna go a full five out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, Barrel aged patients, barley wine, uh, super smooth, even with some congestion here. You know, I'm still able to taste and smell this and uh, highly recommend that. So see if you can find this. It's out of Fulton, uh, Minnesota, out of the out of uh, Minneapolis. So uh, I don't know how widely it's available, but if you do see it, uh, trust me, it's a nice treat. So let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking at quotes about writing by writers, and I came across this one by Somerset Maugham that I just think is perfect. It goes something like this. If you can tell stories, create characters, devise incidents, and have sincerity and passion, it doesn't matter a damn how well you write. <laughs> See you guys next week. The rig. The rig. How is she? Got a crack timing case cover and it's broken a couple of teeth off the timing gear. Got a crack timing case cover. It's broken a couple of teeth off the timing gear. The radiator's damaged at the core. The radiator's damaged at the core. It's got a cracked water pump. It's got a cracked water pump. And a fractured injector line. It's got a fractured injector line. <laughs> well, what does all that mean? Yeah, okay, but what does that mean? What does that mean? Twenty-four hours. Twenty-four hours? They've got 12. You've got 12. Okay. okay. Get